Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Sid, for that incredible presentation. It was totally mind blowing. I had never been exposed to the Arpieta tradition or ever seen any, but having seen that collection at the Museum of Memory was just so amazing. So to have the chance to follow your journey in, in learning and creating, I'm, I'm so excited about it and just so humbled to be amidst this collection of incredible artists, researchers, people, storytellers, um, and so excited about what we're going to learn together and create over the course of this year. Thank you so much for convening this wonderful event. Um, my name is Charlie Hoffs. I use she, her pronouns, and um, I am excited to share about my work that I'll be doing 1,200 miles north of us uh, in Arica, in the far north. Um, this year, I'll have the opportunity of working with um, Dr. Manuel Prieto at the University of Tarapaca and his research team. Um, and here's an image I took from a, um, a feria last weekend um, up in Arica. Um, that I'll talk more about. It's the Feria Hiwasan Marcasa, where um, several vendors from Putre and Visviri and rural areas inland up in the pre Cordillera outside Arica um, bend their charqui and, and, and woven products. Um, lots more to talk about on weaving um, and, and other goods up in, up in Arica, and I'll share more about this market. Um, and as we move into this presentation and, and as we situate ourselves here in this work, of course, we acknowledge that here in Santiago, we are on Mapuche ancestral lands. My work in Arica is on Aymara and Quechua lands. Of course, all of this is a vast oversimplification and reduction. The most important point being that um, folks have for a very long time and continue to steward this land um, and, and defend its resources. Um, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have the opportunity to, to learn from um, the continued usage of these practices and stewardship that folks, that folks continue in this work, which is very crucial, of course, as well to food systems work. Oh, and just as we, as we move in here, I'm so excited for the opportunity to share a couple photos of my friends and, and mentors and peers and colleagues, um, but I don't have the explicit consent of everybody pictured to have those shared publicly, except just in this intimate space. So not that anybody would, but if uh, you know we have a drive where these slides are shared, if anybody could just refrain from sharing these slides, um, that would be wonderful to respect uh, everybody in the images that I have here. Um, I am from Southern California, originally Los Angeles, and then Orange County. Um, and then I went to university up at Stanford in Northern California. So California is a super dear place to me. In my undergraduate, I studied chemical engineering, which I studied in order to gain a technical toolbox through which to understand and engage with environmental justice issues. So we're thinking about pesticide contamination. Ellen, we got more to talk about. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, pesticide contamination, toxics um, regulation, uh, thinking about the role of industry, public sector, private sector in developing how we measure and understand um, the amount of pollution and contamination in the air, water, land, resources, um, as well as how can chemical engineering be a tool for environmental justice organizations, researchers, organizers, scholars, um, was grateful to deepen my expertise there. Um, in my master's program at Stanford, I studied community health and prevention research. So excited to learn more from the public health expertise of this group. Um, I studied that in order to deepen my understanding of the public health intersections with environmental justice and also to deepen my mixed methods, qualitative research, social science research skills. Um, and through that program, I did a master's thesis on understanding how food systems courses are being taught at U.S. land-grant universities. So I've loved our Ohio State, Oregon State um, intersections here. And that was how I originally e met Dr. Kate Tully here, um, one of the 500 instructors that I reached out to to get syllabi. Thank you for your syllabus. It has been an invaluable resource. I've just been a fan from afar in the inbox, so I am just dazzled to be in the midst of great food systems pedagogical leadership. Um, yeah, 
some other, I, I just am so blessed to have really gotten to take part in a lot of amazing communities at university and beyond. Um, just a handful of which that have been super formative to me is our environmental justice working group at Stanford, a really broad and diverse coalition of students working across many areas of environmental justice. Um, one uh, partnership, this is not the EJ working group, but a partnership with um, our very, very, again, diverse and broad native student community at Stanford. Um, we, uh, there is a, the, the native student community has a partnership with the Moekma Ohlone tribe on which, which, whose land Stanford occupies and um, native students at Stanford have co-created and are continuing to develop a native plants garden um, on campus. And my friend Jazz uh, is a Yurok tribal member and is, is teaching everybody um, uh, some, some traditional uh, Yurok designs to paint onto the, the garden boxes. Uh, and um, yeah, just a really helpful generative learning space in terms of food sovereignty principles in theory, but also planting stuff. Um, I have had the amazing opportunity for the past five years to be involved with the Stanford Food Institute, um, for which I was a project manager on a project um, called the Black Farmers Initiative, in which Stanford is trying to scale up its procurement from local California, Bay Area, local California-wide and Bay Area and some nationwide black farmers um, who source our dining halls with watermelons and okra and sweet potatoes and collard greens and also trying to expand that institutional procurement model to other universities. Um, uh, having the chance to be here with Mr. Will Scott and Mr. Donald Sherman down in um, Fresno and just awesome great events on campus and learning from um, all they bring to this work. Um, I'm really interested in food policy, organizing, and activism, um, and advocacy. Uh, for three years, I co-led a youth-led food, uh, food policy organizing group of young people called Unbox. We mostly worked around trying to improve and, and, and bring a youth perspective to school meals policy and SNAP policy in the US. Um, and uh, there was a White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and food through which several groups were allowed to kind of have listening sessions and share back content. So here are some co-organizers and I having a listening session where a lot of ideas were shared and a lot of watermelon and snacks were eaten um, prior to that, that conference. Um, I uh, kind of in the food po policy realm, one thing that I was up to last fall, um, I did an internship with um, I was doing immigration casework in the county office of the Santa Clara County Office of Congressman Rocana in, in California, um, where I also had some opportunities to weigh in on some congressional level food policy stuff. Here's my team and I. Um, and um, uh, yeah, just really interested in the intersections of food and policy. And then in terms of the Chile side of where, where, how, how do we get here? Um, I still don't know, and I'm still working backward from, from where we are. Um, but in 2019, um, my best friend Sarah and I um, woofed worldwide opportunities for organic farmers, um, opportunities to kind of volunteer on different farms in different parts of the world. Um, volunteered just on three farms over 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 a summer, the summer after my frost year of college, just a incredibly rewarding, enriching, so challenging for me experience. Um, uh, we worked on a farm on Rapa Nui, which was so awesome. A farm outside of Pomaide. Mason and I were <laughs> having some Pomaide tales, uh, great ceramics and pottery there. Um, and a farm outside of Valparaiso in a rural town called Quiota. Um, here's my friend Catalina and I having an awesome time at this farm that I came back to and visited and worked with them again for a couple weeks, a few, a couple months ago. Um, and the, the Catalina's family is actually going to visit California and stay with my grandma in a couple months. So that full circle is really humbling. Um, and that was a really formative experience. Um, I uh, then did an internship, the Union of Concerned Scientists, that was related to lithium extraction for lithium ion batteries. And that brought me back to Chile. And then I was reading all these papers by Manuel Prieto. And that started a great relationship and for which I'm super grateful. And then, and then we're back to today. I had the chance to arrive here in Chile just around in mid-January again to kind of get my feet wet back again and get going on that Castellano. <laughs> and um, I had the chance to go to a Chaya festival up in Arica, which was super fun. Um, so my work is going to look into uh, food systems in 
Arica in Chile, um, in northern Chile, and trying to understand what would a just sustainable food system look like in Arica, mindful that those are really subjective terms as defined by different people in different ways. And then also importantly, how are community stakeholders working to achieve what they consider to be a just and sustainable food system? Um, I'm gonna blitz through a agricultural food systems history of Arica and I would love to talk about this more if other people are interested, but this is going to go fast. And um, yeah, it's, it's a wild story up there. So around um, 9,000 to 11,000 years ago, kind of contested in the, in the literature, but around 9,000 before Common Era, um, the first people started to live, work, play, grow, eat in, um, in the region that is now Arica, Chile, the Chango and Chinchoro people from around 400 to 900. Um, AD, CE, um, T the Tijuanaco culture um, came to uh, really exist in that area. I had the amazing opportunity to visit the heart of Tijuanaco, the, the main capital city in, out, out on near Lake Titicaca in Bolivia um, a couple weeks ago, which was mind blowing. Um, and then around uh, 900 or to like 1100 again contested um, more so Aymara kingdoms and Aymara speaking um, peoples came to populate the region a lot more 15 uh, around 1500 Inca folks and um, Quechua speaking people came to um, be the empire of the area um, throughout all of this history mostly around the Tijuanaku time but um, throughout this entire history camelids which include yamas alpacas vicuñas and guanacos are just a central part of the food system of the area for um for food for meat but also for fiber um and the oil of the um the grease of the fat is used for cooking oil and for light um the bones are used to make musical instruments the importance of camelids both for food security food sovereignty and the cosmovision of aymara folks um in the past and today cannot be cannot be overstated. Um, I don't have time to talk about the vertical archipelago and the Minca. I would love to talk about it more with everybody else. Um, around 1541, the Spanish arrived for the first time in the area that is now Arica. I gotta go faster. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, just uh, yeah, not not a friendly encounter for sure. But um, also uh, in that arrival is uh, the arrival of several Afro-Chileans um, who were enslaved African people who were brought to Chile. Chile um, uh, had and, and has, in comparison to other Latin American countries, a, a relatively small population of, 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 of enslaved Africans who were brought to Chile. But those who were brought there, there it was because um, from Potosí, which was the largest silver mine in Bolivia. A lot of that silver was transported to Arica, which was a big port, and most of the silver in Spain and, and, and Europe came from this pipeline, and, and um, some um, Afro-Chileans were, um, were, were, were forced into labor, both on those mines and also in, um, in the agricultural valleys. Uh, so, Around 1821, in 1821, Peru becomes a state. Arica is part of Peru at that time. Um, and around the 1840s, people get super excited about sodium nitrate and potassium nitrate because those are good for both explosives and fertilizer. Um, and so lots of nitrates in the guano around certain Caribbean islands, but also mineable sodium nitrate in the um, nitrate saltpeter buildups in this particular area of Arica, Chile. At, uh, and this becomes super exploited over time, um, starting around the 1840s, in which um, you, have, you have many laborers brought from many parts of the world, including, including China, importantly, um, to mine uh, sodium nitrate for fertilizer in, in northern Chile. Um, and actually like 50% of the fertilizer in the world was coming from Arica at this point. So it's really a crucial point in the, in the global food systems transition. And then you have the 
formerly indigenous agriculture of the valleys up there turned into commodity crop growth to just feed the laborers and the cattle and mules. So you have a lot of alfalfa and wheat production. Then we have in the 1879 to 1884 time, El Guerra, the, the, the War of the Pacific, um, where Chile annexes, uh, violently conquers and become, begins to control and seeds um, uh, the region that is now Tarapaca and the region of Arica and Paninacota into Chile um, from Peru and Bolivia, largely for these nitrate saltpeter um, resources. Then we see a lot of investment and industrialization agriculturally in the zone. We see um, several intersecting agendas. Five more minutes. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, 1948, the Canal Lauca. Um, organizes and, and directs the water to f be ir used for irrigation in the Azapa Valley um, up in northern Chile. 1953, Arica becomes a free port, so that facilitates more uh, low cost, low tariff, low tax free trade with the rest of the world and, and the Western world in the global north. The Junto de Adelanto de Arica in 1958 is also more hydroelectric, energy-focused infrastructure, transport, and agricultural investments in the region, so more industrialization. September 11th of 1973 is a date at which a lot changes, and um, the Pinochet dictatorship deepens these industrializing um, and neoliberalizing reforms to agriculture in the Arica region. Um, we see the in the implementation of the water code, the privatized water system of Chile. And then part of what happens is this tomato monocrop. So one of the most important things about the agricultural system of Arica, Chile, it is the city of eternal spring. There is a year round growing season. So when in the Chilean winter, when all of the farms outside in the, in the, in the Santiago region are not growing all the tomatoes that they usually grow, tomatoes are mass imported from Arica to the rest of Chile. That is the main source of tomatoes in the off season, Arica, which mind you is in the driest desert in the world. And we're growing tons and tons of, of, of tomatoes for, for regional export. Um, in 1992, um, an important cultural um, and social and, and, and metaphysical shift in the public consciousness of Chile is the indigenous law in which people begin to be able to legally identify themselves with particular indigenous communities. And this causes a, a kind of public organizing shift and also has challenging consequences as well for indigenous communities. 1996 is when we start to see certain types of legislation around transgenic foods being passed. The UPOV convention, China, Chile joins that, which uh, grants certain rights to breeders, to, to plant breeders, to have intellectual property over the seeds, transgenic seeds that they create. Um, in 2003, the fruit fly is eradicated from the um, entire region of Arica, which allows many more different types of plants to be propagated. And so we see the implementation of um, more, more hybrid seed breeding. So. Chile is the country in the global south of the world that exports the most transgenic GMO seeds to the rest of the world. It is illegal under the Chilean law to grow GMOs here, but seeds can be iterated here and exported. And Arica is the place where the most of that is happening because of this year-round growing season. Um, so we see, OK, uh, what's happening today? Um, <laughs> uh, Here's a difference that's happening today. Um, super drought in the north of Chile and growers are like, how do we still extract from, how do we squeeze the toothpaste tube of water to continue to keep up the insane amount of production that we were doing in this, in this very desert zone? Um, thank you so much. Um, and a lot of that is transitioning from the agriculture that is there to more precision agriculture, do things in greenhouses, try to really be specific about exactly how much water we need to use, exactly how many of all the inputs we use. And while this adapts to very, very intense, deepeningly intense climate 
challenges, it also makes it only possible for large and more technical, technologically adapted farmers. I see nods from, from ag folks in the audience. Thank you for affirming this. Um, and yes, so that trend is happening and it's interesting. A lot of stuff is going on and there's a lot of different factors. And um, uh, yeah. um, and in like trying to weave all these pieces together um, to kind of grounding things I just want to continue to be rooted in in this work is just one, just the very lived and embodied urgency of everything that's going on, of everything that everybody is researching and in including this project. Um, when I had the opportunity to go and work back in my friend's farm in Valparaiso outside Quiota, we were right in the middle of where the fires hit. And um, I am so blessed that I was able to safely leave uh, that area once the roads became available back from Valparaiso back to Santiago. Um, and my friends ended up being fine. Um, but, but, but know a lot of people who, they, they are, not everybody was fine. Um, and it's, it's real. And this is climate change in the real world. Um, and just like the way that industry intersects with all of our bodies and lives and livelihoods. My friend um, who is from Bolivia, but has been a copper miner with Codelco in Chile for the last 23 years has just taught me a lot about livelihoods, labor organizing and heavy industry in Chile and just reminding ourselves that these are rooted topics that, that make all of our lives and every material that we use has a human story behind it. Um, just wanna briefly allude to um, and so that's the first factor, just grounding in an emergency. The second factor that will dictate the course of my project is what my community partners say might be helpful and of service and perhaps of material use. So that remains to be seen. And I'm excited to move forward to that together. One of these groups is the Red de Ganaderos, a group of Aymara indigenous llama and alpaca herders who have a very solid and well-organized political agenda in which they're trying to visibilize their important work for food sovereignty, food security, and global sustainability in Arica, Chile. There was this awesome, um, this is actually a photo I took in Bolivia. So this is Quechua land, so different context a little bit, but super cute camelids. Uh, and uh, the Red de Ganaderos is doing really powerful organizing work in, in the Arica and Parinacota region. Um, here's a conference that was hosted in Arica. This is a photo from their Instagram. I did not attend. I was looking from afar and scrolling and really sad that I wasn't there. Um, another amazing, to come back to it, uh, organization and convener of groups is uh, this this regional feria, Jiwasan Marcasa, which means like our, our pueblo, our país in Aymara. Um, so I was there a couple weeks ago and um, got these earrings there from a weaver named Delia who lives in Visfiti. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, folks selling potatoes from Putre and um, oregano from Socorama through through worker collaboratives and indigenous uh, joint collaborative brands. There's also a great organization called Oro Negro and other Afro-Chilean organizations amongst Afro-Chilean agriculturalists in the area. I'm really, really excited to learn from all these stakeholders on their vision for a just and sustainable food future and if my project and research can be of service in advancing their goals. Um, especially in the UN International Year of the Camelid, which is this year. Wow, great opportunity. I'm really excited to do so and so grateful for the opportunity. Um, I uh, have a lot of literature that I'd love to share in our upcoming soon to be a uh, journal reading club, ag reading club. Uh, please let us know. I'm uh, instituting this right now. <laughs> if, if anybody would like to nerd out about agricultural literature in, in Chile, and um, just this was formed four years ago when I was farming on Rapa Nui, just having a really fantastic time. Never would have imagined that I'd have the opportunity to be back in this context. Thank you so much. Really grateful for my collaborators at the Universidad de Tarapacá. And also thank you so much Fulbright staff and cohort. Can't wait to get to know one another better. <laughs>